So we're assuming at this point that transformations is continuing. So we'll uh, hopefully jog your memory a little bit, but uh, it wasn't that long ago we built them all up again. But we're specifically going to be looking at two functions. So one being the sine of x. So everybody meet sine. Um, this is one graph which you're going to get to know tremendously well. Uh, a lot of applications rely on this. So while I do that, we'll copy uh, what the sine graph looks like into your notes. But you'll need to be able to reproduce this sine graph uh, fairly quickly. Just because we will, in fact, be using it so much. And um, obviously, I have some strategies here because, oops, connecting the dots is a good one to start with. But um, I have some strategies that will help you remember how to do this quickly. But for now, let's just have a peek at what it looks like. Ugh. I know apparently I failed finger painting in kindergarten and I never recovered. There. Okay, so while you're copying that, I'll just tell you one of the reasons that uh, these functions are so um, prevalent is that this is uh, the laws of nature that are periodic is where we see these things. So this might represent, for example, hours of daylight in Surrey. Um, as we go from, um, this would be, say, spring, when the days are, I guess, eight hours, to summer when the days are 12 hours, down to, oh, everyone hates when you get to winter and the days are like five hours long, right? So um, that repeating every year through the cycles of the year, this actually the Earth tilting, right? But that repeating, if we graphed it, the number of hours per day would look like this. Um, the tides, as they come in and out, same idea. Uh, anything that repeats with that um, uh, periodic motion will be modeled with one of these graphs. Uh, for some reason, they're obsessed with uh, Ferris wheels. And Ferris wheels are like the question of choice for grade 12 math. I don't know why, but anyways. Okay, so cosine. Everybody meet cosine. Um, I'll copy it into the uh, graph for you before we talk about strategies. But again, the goal will be that you get comfortable doing both of these graphs and transforming them. Okay, I lost it near the end of it, but I'll give you a minute just to copy it. So I'll pause this here. So we'll take these now and we're going to talk specifically about some trig stuff. So these are the vocab that you're going to run across in trig that we didn't talk about for generic transformations. Uh, the first thing we'll call the center line. Sometimes it's called as the vertical displacement. You might even be able to figure out by the name vertical displacement how that connects to what you already know about transformations. That's just a translation up and down. So where we usually look for these things is the middle and then once we've located the middle I'll draw it here in green if we want to draw another graph we can simply look at where's the new center line after the transformation It's helpful because of the shape of this graph if you know where the center is you kinda of know where it wibbles and wobbles above and below those are actual words right wibble and wobble maybe okay so the other thing we're going to take a look at here, um, I call this one the starting line. It's not actually a, a technical term, um, but the technical word that's sometimes used is the phase shift. So anybody in physics right now? No one's willing to admit it. <laughs> um, but uh, the phase shift is when we push this graph left or right. So for these graphs, these are the base graphs. They just start at zero. So the starting line, I'm going to do vertical here. And it'll make sense why we're recording this when I show you the transformations. Okay. Uh, the next thing is the amplitude, which this is a measure of how tall the graph is. Uh, what we're going to do, though, is we're going to ignore its sign, the S-I-G-N. Um, and I'll show you with a picture here its amplitude. So here's the amplitude there. So the amplitude is just the distance from the center line which means that we don't consider the negatives or positives. Or sorry, we don't consider the negatives, just the positives. So in this graph up here, can you tell me what the amplitude is? One, yeah. So that's the way the base graph starts out, at one. 
So the music program is pretty big here. Uh, if you've seen an oscilloscope and somebody puts sound through it, sound makes these waves too. Uh, the amplitude is how noisy it is. Like very loud is a very high amplitude. And uh, the next thing we'll talk about is how you get the different notes out of it. So the period of the graph is uh, how often it repeats. So what I'll do is I'll highlight for you. Not that you need to keep this in your notes, but I'm going to erase this in a second. If you look at what I just highlighted, you should be able to find it again if you keep looking on that graph. And in fact, it just goes on and on and on forever like that. So we call these graphs periodic because they repeat themselves. I can also show you on the cosine graph that that sort of valley repeats itself over and over and over again. So I've only drawn two, but I could draw 100, I could draw 1,000, I just that's boring and I don't want to do it. Okay, so it does repeat itself over and over again like that. And the period is how long it takes to repeat. So in our case, I can see the distance here is 2 pi. And the distance here was also 2 pi. So period is... The distance for one complete cycle of a graph that repeats. So sometimes, like in physics, you won't actually talk about the period. You'll just talk about the cycle, like the frequency, how many cycles per second. But uh, we're speaking about kind of the same language there. Uh, that frequency is the pitch, the notes, how high, how low they go. Or you could think about it as the period of the graph changes, so it is the notes. So here's my tip uh, that we'll take a look at to help you go through these graphs quite quickly. Is uh, I do this in my head. I divide it into four intervals, and we'll see why that's convenient. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, let's see here. How about I pick, uh, we've got blue on there. Um, red will work, I guess. And I'm going to draw a line. Here's the beginning, and here's the end. And now I'm just going to chop it into four intervals. So I'll label them for you. So here's number one, two, three, and four. And does anybody notice why that's convenient to do that? Like when I chop it, where does I, you know, what's special about where I've done that chopping in four different spots? That's okay, that thump will, it probably did make it on YouTube, but you're famous now. Exactly, the minimums, the maximums, troughs, crests, it's also on the center line too. So if you noticed when I was jotting in the points at the beginning, that's all I did was I put in those key points and then I did my wave through it. So right there, that's a key point, that's a key point, that's a key point, that's a key point. And this pattern of going center max, center min, center max, center min, center max, center min, it just keeps going on and on forever. Same thing happens in the cosine graph. So this time I'll, I'll use black since the graph itself is red. But if I cut it into four pieces, there'd be one, two, three, four. And it still hits right at the key points. And it sort of follows the same pattern. Maximum center, minimum center, maximum center, minimum center, max. It's going to keep alternating through those. So that's how I do it fairly quickly. And that's what I suggest you think about when we go. So we'll try and put all these pieces together now. And uh, we'll, we'll try doing some transformations. Okay? But uh, before we abandon all that, let's, let's connect this back to what we just talked about in regular functions. So. We were talking about A as the vertical stretch factor. So what do you think this is going to do now in a trig graph? So take it from what you already know about vertical stretch factor. What's that going to do to these trig graphs when we do a vertical stretch? Increase the amplitude. Yeah, so it's just going to change the amplitude now. So this one becomes amplitude. So really one skill you're going to need to learn about is just this amplitude 
right? Okay. One school, skill you're going to need to learn about is just transferring the vocab. Okay, so we used to call this one here, this B, we used to call that the horizontal stretch factor. Right? How much we stretch or squish it horizontally. Same rules apply, but in trig, we'll take a look at that vocab again. What do you think is going to be affected by the horizontal stretch factor? Yeah, the period of the graph. Right? If we stretch the graph out really wide, then the cycles take longer to repeat. If we shrink it, they don't take as much time. So in this case, um, this one, I'm just going to say it affects the period. Now let's figure out what happens. Okay? Normally it's 2 pi. That's what we just graphed. And there's that scary letter again. B. Can anybody tell me what would the horizontal stretch factor? Oh, that's a bad letter to choose. What would the horizontal stretch factor be if the letter in the function was a B? <laughs> Do you remember the trick that happens with horizontal stretch factors? It's going to be the reciprocal. So can you tell me what will it be if I give you B? The horizontal stretch factor is one over B. Good. So this time normally it's two pi. Now it's going to be. 2 pi times the horizontal stretch factor. So if you want to find that period of the graph, it's 2 pi over whatever number I give you. So again, for speed purposes, it's nice to be able to talk specifically about trig. But if for some reason you lose your notes or you, know, you got hit with a football in gym class today and you forgot everything about trig, you should still be able to recoup some of this from tr tr uh, transformations. OK, last two now. What do you think uh, this? will do to the new trig vocabulary. Which one is it going to change? We only have two left, right? So the starting line? Yeah, the starting line where we uh, begin the graph. So in this case, h used to be left and right. It's going to change the starting line. Oops. Change the starting line. And remember, the physics people here might come across this term, phase shift. So it's worth noting in case you hear that. That's the trig vocab. OK, and then finally, that's only leaving us with one thing. So when we use k, we're talking about the up and down. And for the significant features on a trig graph, I know it moves everybody up and down. But you're going to see it's helpful here that it moves the center line. So the center line is going to take on y equals k. That'll be the new center line of the graph. Whatever number shows up there is the new center line. <coughs> so this is a suggested sequence that helps you keep yourself organized. Again, if you forgot it all, that's fine. Transformations still work like you already know them. You can map key points and replot them. But this is a speed thing. So for trig. This is going to help you get the fastest trig graph plotted. Um, but again, not to say you won't be able to do it with just a simple mapping from your transformations. So let's give it a shot. I'll give you the uh, sequence for the first one. I'll let you try the next one by yourself. The first thing that we want to do is go for a center line. So can anybody tell me what the center line is on this first blank graph? This one always seems to trip people up. When it's not there, what's the number? Zero, yeah. If nothing is present, it's the same thing as saying plus zero. So it would be like center line zero. So that's what I'm going to do here. This center line is just rough work. It's not actually part of the graph. So you can just lightly put it in there or dash line it or something like that. OK, then the next thing I recommend you do is figure out where does the graph start now. So where should I put my starting line? Close. It's not pi over 2, but it is negative. negative pi over 2, right? It goes <laughs> left by pi over 2. So here is where this graph will start. OK? And now I want to know uh, how big is the graph going to be when I have to put it on there? 
So what's the period of this graph here? Normally, the sine takes a period of? 2 pi. 2 pi, thank you. In your notes, just on the previous page, somewhere near the top. 2 pi is one cycle. Um, is there a horizontal stretch factor here to change that? Nope. So we know it's going to go to 2 pi. So let's, let's move over by 2 pi. There's a, a 1 pi. There would be 2 pi right there. OK, so that's what one cycle will look like. And now I'll be able to show you where the key points are going to be in here. Four equal spots will look like this. One, two, three, four. So the sine graph starts right there. It goes up. Hmm. How far does this one go up? Three. The vertical stretch factor has pulled the amplitude to three, so it's going to go up and then down to the bottom, back to the top. And at this point, I should have enough confidence to continue this pattern. And generally, I'll probably ask you for two cycles. You can do more if it just you like filling up the graph, but two is probably going to be sufficient. So if I continue the pattern, that means I go back to the maximum, down to the center, down to the minimum, back to the center, and the second cycle would look like this. Okay? Whoops. So I'm going to invite you to take a few minutes here. I'll pause us and uh, we'll take a look at this cosine graph. Um, so try this one with a neighbor. And for now, what I'd like you to do is try using your trig terminology for the sake of speed. We'll talk about how it could be done as a just a generic transformation um, later, OK? So most of you I see are making good headway. Quite a few people are finished. I'll, I'll try to pick up here. So I'll walk through this one. Um, I like to start at the center line because I can see it right there. This is the new center line because I've moved the graph up by one. The starting point means I've moved this right by, uh, what have I moved it right by? Uh, pi over 2. So I should have a starting line here. And I need to know how big this graph's going to be when I draw it, so I want to know the period now. Here's a horizontal stretch factor of a quarter. So 2 pi is the period is going to become 2 pi times a quarter, which is pi over 2. A lot of people I saw have figured that out. So here's where one cycle will end. and. I can't keep going forward, so I may have to go back to show you two cycles on this graph. So in this case, uh, I know a starting point, but I've missed one piece before I graph this. What's the one piece I haven't brought up yet? Yeah, the amplitude. Because I know where it's going to go, but I don't know how high it's going to go up yet. So can anybody help me out there? One, yeah. So here's. Uh, the amplitude there was just a 1. Cosine, I'll take you back to the neat sine and cosine graphs. Cosine starts at the top and drops. It makes that valley. So that's what we're going to do down here is we'll start at the top and draw that valley that looks like a cosine graph. So here's my starting line, center line. So start one up at the top. Drop to the center, drop to the minimum, center, maximum. So one cosine cycle would look about like that. Now, if you go backwards, you just have to do the pattern backwards in your head. From the maximum, you're going to drop to the center, then drop to the minimum, center, maximum. OK. So I'm going to give you a considerable chunk of time here. I'm going to just do these ones, and it's going to just show up. So um, we'll have a discussion about them afterwards, but I'd like you to catch up to me, OK? All right, so let's have a, a look here. You can compare your graphs versus mine. Quite a few of the ones I 
went around to check, looked like they were doing well. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, however, is the factoring in the second version here. So uh, hopefully you're used to that by now, but remember, it's easier to see what's going on in factored form than it is to see it unfactored. So you may be slightly off com compared to me if that's the case. Yep. Yes. So I this is where I went to. Um, we could let's check. I mean, I have been known to make the odd mistake here and there. Oh, good. You guys are still early enough. No one laughed. By the end of the year, everyone goes ha 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 because I tend to make a lot of mistakes anyway. Um, let's see. There's my starting line because I move. Oh, that's not my starting line. Sorry. There's my starting line because I move left by pi over two, and my center line's at minus two. So sine starts on the center and rises. So there's my starting at the center, rising, center, ma uh, minimum, center, maximum, and so on. So I, I, I believe, um, and the amplitude looks like it's four in both cases. So I believe this is correct. Because of the factoring. Oh, I see. Yes. So the the starting line, the phase shift, I've moved it to pi over two. Right. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Um, I'll just show you real quick because I guess um, I've already filled this in here. Do you know what the longest day of the year is? I think yeah, twenty first or twenty second. Let's have a look. So the longest day of the year is like the maximum amount of sunlight. So what graph starts at a maximum? The cosine. So the sine graph is if we started on spring or fall equinox because those would be the middle days. So uh, what you end up with here, did I put in January? Okay, so here is, oh, I guess the graph didn't let me uh, change the, starting point but um, here is a graph starting at January showing you it as the daylight rises and then the daylight falls and the minimum would be around here which again is the December 23rd or 2nd the equinox uh, any idea why there's these weird lines there yeah it's the daylight savings you know the one we all like woohoo fall back and then the one we all hate spring forward when you lose an hour of sleep um, I'm told they don't do this in Saskatchewan, so I'm kind of puzzled to know why we would do it if the farmers don't do it, right? But anyway, uh, and then uh, this is a pretty good graph to show too. another the sign relation there as the earth is wobbling. So um, we will talk about applications shortly, but uh, for now, can I just see show of hands how many people have at least one of these two graphs done uh, properly? Okay, no problem. So now we're gonna add a reflection somewhere in the graph and I would like you to think about with your neighbor what this will do when you start graphing it so you'll be tempted to go in autopilot and use your transformations but now a reflection is going to change things for example let's just see if you can figure it out if I normally start at a maximum but I give you an x-axis reflection what do you think would happen yeah that maximum is going to get flipped down to the minimum right so think about how these reflections change the way the graph goes. Okay, I see most people got here. Let's just talk through this reflection just to make sure you're on the right track. Some of you I know had success, but let's clarify it before I cut you loose again on the second one. Now, normally, and I'll do this one in green just so you can see it. Normally you would want to go with the pattern that sine follows, which is center. Then it goes up one, amplitude is one here, to the maximum then center, then minimum, then center. So this green graph, I'll just sort of shade it in a little bit. Oh, that's a terrible sign graph. Let me try that again. Okay. This green graph is if there was no reflection, it would take on sort of this, this shape here. Okay? So how do we do the reflection? Well, there's a couple ways you can interpret that. The first one is that this reflection makes left go right and right go left. Everything horizontal is backwards. 
So if you're telling me that as I move to the right, this is the pattern, then you just need to change the sentence to say, as you move to the left, this is the pattern. So instead of going to the right and the maximum, I go to the left and the maximum. So this is where I would find the actual graph. Then the next one is to go to the center line, but I have to go to the left and find the center line. And I keep moving to the left as I follow the pattern because everything was reflected horizontally. So the actual graph is going to be this purple one. I don't know why I always try to do this so but that's better and then at this point I have enough confidence to continue the pattern so I won't think too much about that reflection I'll just follow the pattern of where the purple dots would have gone but it would be something like this now if you don't follow the way I've said you normally talk left to right sorry question Oh, I went too high. This is what I get for talking and talking and mathing at the same time. <laughs> yes, mistakes and all. It'll be on YouTube there. Okay. Um, so, if you're not following the reflection, as uh, as I said. What you say, as in moving to the right, is now moving to the left. The other thing you can do is a quick sketch in your notes here. You can just say, well, here's what the sine graph normally does. It normally does this. Um, sorry. It normally does this. The reflection will make it do this. Go the opposite way. So the pattern that I would want to follow would be from center to minimum, center to maximum, center to minimum, center to max, and we keep going along that pattern if I look for the pattern in the reflected graph. Okay? So talk to your neighbor. The reflections are a little trickier, but see if you can manage to do this reflection here. So this is where I uh, did my one cycle that you can uh, compare with, and this time the reflection is ev it's going to affect everything vertically because it's a, an x-axis reflection. So what you need to think about is when you use the word maximum, you really mean the word minimum. And when you use the word minimum, you really mean the word maximum because everybody's been flipped that way. So the pattern now goes from minimum to center to maximum and then center back to minimum. Okay, so in that case, that's the way the reflection would work as you walk through that little pattern of the trig graph. So some of you I think need a minute here, I'll just pause this while you take a look at that graph. Alright, so if you're uh, starting to feel like we're doing some graphing and uh, you're getting the hang of it, the only other thing we need to be able to do with these graphs, and we're going to practice this a lot more in applications, is construct a function. So uh, the same way I gave you those logical steps to make life, you know, I guess orderly and easy to graph. If you do those same steps, but instead of graphing it, put together an equation, those same steps will help you walk through these ones getting an equation. Now, one word you're going to see used is sinusoidal. If you haven't already noticed, sine and cosine, they kind of look the same. And there's good reason for that, and we'll talk about that later. But um, they pretty much rep could represent either a sine or a cosine. And in this case, I'm asking you to show me one of each. Okay, so your job is to try and get a graph that will work and you can verify it in your graphing calculator. Okay, so I'll have you and your neighbor work through them. Look for the center line. Where does it start if it's a cosine? Where does it start if it's a sine graph? Put the pieces back together and then graph it. See if you're right. Okay, let's, let's go through a couple of these together because uh, I can see good progress, but there's three surefire ones that are easy to get every time. The only thing that's going to be uh, difficult is the one final piece that I'll walk you through here. So, did anybody find one really easily when they looked at the picture? Find one of the missing pieces of the function? <laughs> My fault for not being clear about that. Yes. Vertical displacement, the center line. Okay, how did you do it? You just looked for the middle part? Yeah, so you can just look for the middle part, but let's formalize that. What you're actually doing is saying, here's the minimum on the graph, and here's the maximum. Oops. 
So if you want to know the center line, what you're saying is go right in between those. Maximum plus minimum divide by two, which in this graph is five plus one divide by two, which is three. So just in case your eyeballs deceive you and you thought that the center line was two or four, um, this is a very exact way to do it. Halfway between top and bottom, that's the middle. Okay, what other ones did you find easy to do just by looking at? Mm -hmm. amplitude? amplitude, yeah, how do you get the amplitude? Okay, so you're really close, the difference between the maximum and the minimum. I'll show you what that would be, That's, uh, and then maybe you can revise that for us. There's the distance between them. Oh, between the maximum and the center. Okay, so yeah, or the maximum or the minimum in the center. But basically, we just want to cut it in half. You take the entire distance and just chop it in half. That's what the amplitude will be. So amplitude, again, visually, great. Visuals fail you is going to be the maximum minus the minimum divided by 2. And in our case here, that's 5 minus 1 divided <laughs> by 2. So we get a 2. Okay, there is one more which is easy to get. Anybody find any other piece that was? Can you just like choose the starting line? Or... So starting line is a little bit more thought required. The period is going to be one which we only end up with a single answer on. So the period is the next one I want to show you. Um, here you can do it as the distance from a maximum to maximum or a minimum to minimum because that represents one complete cycle once you hit the next maximum or the next minimum. In this graph, you only can see the maximums, so that's how far you'd go. And in case it's hard to read, that's pi there, uh, sorry, negative pi, and that's pi there, so this is actually two pi for one complete cycle. Um, there's another way to do it, and that's, well, did anybody figure out another way of doing this? Yeah, okay. Um, another way of doing it is to say, well, look at this. This piece is exactly half, as is this piece right here. So two times the distance from a maximum to a minimum, or a minimum to a maximum, uh, will also tell you what the period is. That's exactly half of a cycle if you go from one extreme to the other. So in our case, it still would give us 2 pi. Um, so yeah, we only really have one piece that's missing here is the phase shift. And uh, there's many answers. So let me tell you what I would do here. I would just look for the simplest one I could probably find, um, which means for me, you know, there's no restriction. I would start my sine graph right there because that is right where I see a sine graph about to go. So that means I would have to have moved this graph to the right by pi over 2. There are many possible answers, but one example for the sine graph is to go right by pi over 2. Okay? Now, if I was to pick a cosine graph, Again, I'd like the simplest one I can find. And on the graph that I've been given, I can just pull it right off of there because maximum, center, minimum, center, maximum, that's one full cosine cycle. Yes, if you'd like to be creative, you could pick this one. You can even be more creative and pick further ones out. But let's just say that this one, if I do a cosine, I've gone left by pi. So I'll put the pieces into a function for you. One of them could look like this. And the other one could look like this. So I'll ask you to do the same thing with the next graph and see if you can come up with two functions. Again, phase shift, there are many possibilities. But two functions, one sine, one cosine, that would graph the uh, given picture. So just for you to check over, that's my solution for two possibilities. I use the phase shift right here. 
for sine and a phase shift right here for cosine. It's okay as long as you're okay with being on YouTube, you can you can talk, but I don't think they'll be able to voice ID you. Maybe, you never know, right? Uh, so here, we got the last thing to look at is a tangent. Uh, just fair warning for the tangent. Uh, it is the expectation you're familiar with tangent. However, the rigor involved is not as great. So we won't be looking at doing all kinds of transformations to it. Um, we just go with the basic shape and know that one or two transformations might appear. So I'm not really going to emphasize the tangent too much at this point in our course, but familiarity is expected from you. So let's take a look at what this graph looks like. First thing you need to know is there are asymptotes. Does anybody know what that word means? Yeah, it doesn't touch the line. That's, that's a, a good way to think about it. Um, I'm going to put some key points here to help you find this picture. But these points will be on there. And this is what the tangent graph looks like. So it's hugging this asymptote on that side. And then it sneaks over to the other side where it does the same thing. So that there is one cycle of your tangent graph. Anybody notice how big that cycle is? One pi, yes. So this is a little bit, uh, not I would say confusing, but you have to be careful because the sine and cosine we already looked at were two pi. So one pi for the period. Um, if I wanted to see it again, I could move by pi and redraw it. So I'll go, there'll be uh, one dot there, one dot there, one dot there, and from the asymptote through those points, and then up the other asymptote. So here's three cycles as a sketch. So the asymptotes that you're going to find, um, they happen at pi over 2. There's one right here. Another one at 3 pi over 2. Negative uh, pi over 2. Uh, negative 3 pi over 2, but uh, we don't like to list everything like that. And in fact, it's pretty hard to do that. It would take you forever. So we like to just list it by giving a little bit of a formula that describes it. And I'll explain how the formula works in a second. But uh, this basically says Every pi over 2 um, plus pi, you'll jump onto another asymptote. Why do you think it is every pi over 2 that it repeats itself? So you can keep using this formula as long as you want. But how is it that I know it will repeat every pi? That's the period of the graph. So if you're looking for the same feature, you find it every pi. That's how far apart the period goes. Good. So here, just a reminder about domain and range. Our domain is no longer all real numbers. So you can't land on the asymptote. So x cannot equal anywhere in here where you had one of them. I won't write the where n is an integer again there, but it, uh, it is the, uh, a necessary thing to put in just to be specific about it. Um, and then the range is all real numbers. Even though you can't see it, that asymptote keeps going on and on and on, so you'd end up having all real numbers here for your range. So some key points that I had labeled in, I would start with these ones here at 0, 0, 1, 1, uh, sorry, it's not 1, 1, <laughs> there by pi's. So that's pi over 2, or pi over 4 and 1. Pi over 4 and 1. And then over here, this would be at negative pi over 4 and 1. And you can find them again every how far? 
Every pie. Yeah, so you'll find them again every pie. So as I said, familiarity is the key here. This is enough of the pieces, and every pie it would repeat itself, that uh, we will leave our discussion of tangent at these key pieces and seeing what the shape of it goes as.